Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Claire and this is Yoli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And in today's video, I'm gonna be taking you through some top tips for keeping your houseplants healthy and growing over the winter months, as well as some things that you can be doing to keep the cost down, because I know it's a really difficult time at the moment. I know a lot of us are struggling and I know plant care can be quite expensive, especially when you start thinking about things like heating and lighting and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I hope you, I hope you enjoy it and I hope you find it useful. Let's get into it. So a lot of people commonly notice at this time of year that their plant's growth is going to start to slow right down, which can often be accompanied with other issues such as yellowing, browning, pests, you name it, all the sort of stuff that we really don't want to be happening. And I think a lot of the time it's very easy to assume that this kind of period of dormancy is just normal and that there's nothing we can do about it. But it is simply just your plants responding to environmental changes such as heat and light and all that sort of stuff. And I think so long as you're aware of that and you're able to kind of put certain measures in place, it is perfectly possible to keep your plants growing healthily and giving you new growth as well all the year round. I'm always banging on about how heat, light, nutrients and humidity really do tend to equal much healthier and faster growth in tropical plants. And these are all things that naturally decline at this time of year. There's obviously far less hours of light. The light that your plants are receiving is gonna be much less intense. The temperature naturally drops. You put the central heating on, that takes away natural humidity in the air, all of this stuff. So firstly, I'm gonna start off by talking about lights because it is obviously probably the most important thing when it comes to growing healthy plants. And although yes, all plants will have slightly different light requirements, some will be slightly more adaptable and tolerant to lower light conditions or lower hours of light, for example. But on the whole, as kind of a general rule, most tropical plants are gonna enjoy between 14 and 16 hours of light a day. And I know that that does seem like a huge amount of light when you think about it, or you think about potentially running your grow lights for that period of time. But just think about why the growing season is referred to as the growing season. The spring and summer months typically do tend to provide between 14 to 16 hours of light a day. And that is when we get the most growth. And that is when on the whole, our plants tend to be doing better. When the hours of light are longer, it's essentially mimicking their natural environment, meaning that your plants are able to photosynthesize a lot more effectively and therefore give you lots of lovely new growth. So the first thing that you want to think about is how you can maximize your plant's light absorption. And I know I bang on about this in pretty much all of my care videos, but the first and probably the easiest way of doing this is just making sure that you keep their leaves really, really clean. I recently, I've actually got one here. It's a little bit dusty, but I recently discovered microfiber gloves it's very dusty and it does need a wash, but these are honestly absolutely amazing. I, I used to use a microfiber cloth, but now I just pop this on, go around, give my plant's leaves a really good dust, make sure that there's no dirt or anything like that on there because this essentially acts like a shield and means that your plants aren't able to absorb the light so effectively. And on that note as well, and this is one that isn't spoken about as much, but I think it is super, super, super important at this time of year, is keeping your windows clean, both the outside and the inside of your windows, because again, a buildup of dust and dirt on your windows is also, it's pretty much gonna act like a sheer curtain or something like that. And if the hours of light and the intensity of the light isn't that great for your plants in the winter anyway, that is not gonna do them any favors. Another thing as well that costs absolutely nothing, but does mean that your plants are gonna be able to get more light is, I mean, it's really obvious, but just moving them closer to a window, moving them closer to a light source. For example, I've got a lot of my low light plants down in my basement room with me at the moment. I've got a lot of calatheas down there. I've got a lot of ZZ plants, Sansevieria, all that sort of stuff. And although most of the year round, yes, they are really, really happy there, unless I wanna get my grow lights going down there at this time of year, I do tend to bring them upstairs just so that they've got a little bit more lights because otherwise they are gonna be much more prone to issues because they're not getting everything that they need from the lights. Obviously as well, grow lights are a really, really good option. I do use them myself. I've got grow lights here, I've got grow lights downstairs. And nowadays I tend to only use LEDs. I know they do have a slightly higher on the whole upfront cost, but they are fairly cheap to run. I did actually make a full video about choosing grow lights and how 
to choose them and all that sort of stuff a while ago. So I'll link that video down below, but I'll also link all of the grow lights that I personally use and have got on really well with. As I say, I know running grow lights can be expensive and it's not something that all of us are able to do all of the time. So one thing that you can do and I found to be really effective is using either a reflector or tin foil or something like that and just kind of laying it under the grow light so that you can reflect the light. And it's almost like running two grow lights instead of one, but for the same price, if that makes sense. It just helps the light to target different areas of the plants and it kind of just maximizes the light that they're receiving. That as well, I was going to say mirrors. Mirrors, I, I wouldn't personally use mirrors with grow lights. I was reading about this on a forum recently and I know a lot of people were saying that infrared reflection can cause a lot of heat to build up and that can cause foliage to burn and stuff like that. So as I say, something like tinfoil or a reflector would be my personal choice. But then again, in terms of mirrors, when it comes to natural light, that is where you can really, really optimize it. For example, if you have got a room that's only got maybe one window on one side of it, if you do place some mirrors on the back wall facing that window, it is gonna reflect the natural light and mean that your plants are able to absorb more. And obviously that is a much cheaper alternative. So yeah, if you're using reflectors and mirrors in the right way, then it might mean that instead of having to run 10 or 20 grow lights, then you only have to run one or two at one time, which obviously works out so much better for the planet and for your pocket as well. <laughs> but the other product that I wanted to talk to you about, and I thought that I would include this in light because if you watch my other videos, you'll know that I bang on about the brand Liquid Gold Leaf all the time. This isn't sponsored or anything. I just think it's awesome. And they've recently released a product called Photo Plus, which you use it as a foliar spray. And it basically means that the light they are receiving, they're able to absorb more effectively and photosynthesize more effectively. So yeah, again, if you're not in the position to be able to use grow lights all the time, but you want to encourage photosynthesis in your plants, then I would personally highly recommend it. It also just helps to boost your plant's immunity and improve their resistance to abiotic Abiotic stress, which is everything pretty much that we've been talking about so far. Abiotic stresses are just negative impacts on your plants that happen from non-living factors. So things like light, heat, temperature, humidity, all that sort of stuff. It's just about finding the right balance and trying to mimic your plant's optimum conditions in the best possible way you can. I'm not saying you're always going to get it just right. I'm not always going to get it just right either. I have plant issues all the time, but it's just about doing as much as you possibly can to keep them happy. And and on that note as well, when I actually meant to say this about grow lights, but I was speaking to somebody recently and they were saying that they found a very cheap to run, but very low output grow light. And could they just leave that running pretty much 24 seven for their plants and would they be happy? And I know I have seen quite a lot of these types of grow lights come on the market recently. And the answer is, in my opinion, no. Darkness is just as important for your plants as light is as well. If you're giving your plants 24 hours of light a day, then they're not going to be able to properly regenerate their cells in order to grow healthily, and they're likely going to be very, very, very stressed. So as I've already said, moving your plants closer to a light source, keeping the leaves clean, keeping windows clean, running grow lights, reflecting light in any way you can, that would be, in my opinion, the best possible thing to do. And just kind of tying into that as well, I think there's such a common misconception that lots of growth means that your plant is healthy and a lot of the time, kind of like almost if you compare it to like Hoya's flowering, for example, a lot of the time it can mean that your plant's stressed. I'm not saying that when a Hoya always flowers, it's stressed. They can flower because they're happy, but sometimes, and I've actually, sorry, I'm going on a big tangent now. I've actually got a very good example of this. I've got two pothos plants, one of which has not been kept in the best conditions. I just have really neglected that plant, if I'm being completely honest. I haven't been very on it with feeding it or anything like that. And you can tell that although that one is growing a lot quicker, Quicker than the other one. The growth it's producing is very small. It really doesn't look as healthy. It doesn't look as vibrant. As I say, I'll put clips of both of them in so you can kind of see the healthy one versus the non-healthy one side by side. But I think for everybody, the focus over winter should be not to keep your plants kind of pumping out loads of new growth, but just to keep them as stable and as healthy as you possibly can. So that when it comes to spring, they will have lots of energy reserves there and they will be in the best possible position to start giving you some beautiful new growth. Also with the pothos plants that I just showed you, the one that has been growing more out of stress and hasn't been giving me very healthy growth, 
That one has been so much more susceptible to pests. This summer, I think I've had thrips, mealybugs and spider mites on that plant and the other one that's been fairly close to it has been absolutely fine and again pests are just drawn to plants that are not that healthy. It's kind of like when you see a David Attenborough and you see the predators kind of seeking out the weakest animal in the pack to take down first. It's the exact same principle with pests and plants so yes as I have said health is way more important than growth. When it comes to watering over the winter months, this is an area where I think a lot of people, including myself in the past, have gone very, very, very wrong just because it's so easy to think your plants are ready for a drink when they're not. There's so many environmental changes, things like heating, central heating and stuff like that can really trick you into thinking your plants are ready for a drink and actually you can end up causing a lot more issues by giving them water when they're not actually ready for it. An example of this is my big euphorbia, which I will put a clip in off because that plant, I would say over the growing season, I tend to water about once a week. Obviously, I've said it in other videos, I never schedule my watering, I just monitor the soil, but I usually water that one about once a week and come spring and summer, that turns into about once a month just because that plant really doesn't need it. But when you do have central heating running, it often causes the top layer of soil to dry out quite quickly, which unless you are really kind of carefully monitoring your soil, can make you believe that it's time to water again and then, you're dealing with things like root rot, fungal issues, all that sort of stuff that you don't want to be dealing with at any time of year, but you definitely don't want to be dealing with them in winter because it can be so much harder for your plants to bounce back over this time because they're not always so resilient. As I'm sure most of you know already, in the same way as light that we spoke about earlier, each of your individual different types of plants is also gonna require different amounts of water in order to stay happy. And I usually just test that by sticking my finger down into the soil, but at this time of year, if you're not quite sure, I would highly recommend using a moisture meter just because this can, again, if you don't trust your own judgment, give you a more accurate reading of when your plant is actually ready for a drink. And again, as I have said in pretty much all of my care videos, I do bang on about it a lot. But as usual, if you are not quite sure and you're kind of on the edge, like teetering on the edge of do I water or do I don't, do I don't? do I not water, then I would always say underwatering is always better than overwatering. Just because on the whole, it tends to be so much easier to bring a plant back from near death if it's been underwatered as opposed to overwatered. And alongside watering, it's also really important to talk about fertilizing. And this is something that I have kind of come 360 on in the last year. When I, even when I first started on YouTube, I was saying only fertilize during the growing season, always stop over winter. And that is what I did for a very long time. But if you've watched my videos for a while, you'll know that last year I conducted a little experiment and I took two plants that were both actively growing, identical plants, fertilized one, not the other. And I found that the one that I did fertilize grew a lot healthier, a lot fuller, and just gave me lots of lovely growth, whereas the other one became a little bit stunted and didn't do as well. So although there are some plants that might not actually need to be fertilized over the winter months, assuming they're potted in a nutritious soil, if your plant is actively growing, personally, I would say continue to fertilize, maybe just slightly reduce your dosage of fertilizer, but that is what I'm doing now and touch all the wood. My plants seem really, really happy. Again, I'm using, <laughs> I banged on about it so much. I am using liquid gold leaf fertilizer. It contains pretty much every single essential nutrient that your plants need for healthy growth. And unlike a lot of other shop bought fertilizers, it doesn't damage the soil microbes. So again, it focuses on the health of your plant and not just the growth. That being said, it has given me some really great growth as well, which is awesome. But yes, I would never use fertilizer to try and kickstart a plant back into action if it does appear to have gone into dormancy. If that is the case, obviously, again, research what that plant likes, but increasing the light, increasing the humidity, increasing the heat, all that sort of stuff is gonna be the most important thing that you can do instead of just trying to overload it with nutrients and hope that that will do something because a lot of the time it can actually do your plant a lot more harm than good. I've also had quite a lot of questions recently about repotting and propagating over the winter and whether or not you should do it or shouldn't do it. I know people say different things. I don't think there is a clear cut answer to that. I tend to still repot and propagate, but that's because 
I work very, very hard to keep the conditions as stable as possible for my plants. Most of them continue to grow over the winter months, not all of them. If they're not growing and, for example, repotting isn't essential, then I won't do it. But if I do have a plant that I can tell is incredibly root bound and I think is going to suffer more, then yes, I will absolutely continue to repot all the year round. And again, the same goes for propagating. This year I'm going to be using my cabinets because my cabinet just provides the most incredible conditions for my plants. Again, I've spoken about it before, but the light, the heat, the humidity, everything in there is pretty much like a lovely summer's day. So I don't really worry about propagating so long as I'm able to keep the conditions stable. However, if, for example, if I only had a very cold, dark room that maybe summertime was amazing, wintertime was awful, I wouldn't probably chop up one of my favourite plants and try and get it going in those conditions. It's just, it's all about the conditions. So yes, on the whole, I do still repot and propagate if I have to. If I don't have to, I won't do it. And if you do do it, try to make sure that you can keep the conditions as good for, as possible for your plants. Wow, that was the worst way of saying it. Did that make sense? Another thing that a lot of tropical plants really do not cope well with at this time of year is the lower drops in temperature. And yes, it might be easy to think, okay, well, I'll just whack the central heating up. But as I've already said, that firstly drains so much of the natural humidity from the air. And secondly, it's very, very, very expensive to do. So I know a lot of us are probably trying to find other ways around that this year. And the first way is something that I, I spoke about a lot when I used to film all my videos downstairs in my basement bedroom, because it does get very, very cold down there. One thing that I've done for years and I found to be really, really effective is to bubble wrap my windows, which I know sounds very bizarre. You can get horticultural bubble wrap, but I personally just use the stuff that comes in packaging and you essentially just spray the bubble wrap and stick it to the window. And that just helps provide a layer of insulation. It means that if leaves are pushed up against windows, they're far less likely to get cold damaged because they won't actually be coming into direct contact with the glass and if you're able to seal the bubble wrap from the top of the frame to the bottom then it often means that your plants aren't going to be as affected badly by cold drafts which are something that you really do need to be careful about as well. Draft excluders as well are a very good idea for drafty doors, drafty windows, because cold drafts over the winter can cause so many issues with your house plants. One other thing to say about the bubble wrap as well is that it doesn't damage your windows in any way. As I say, you literally spray it, stick it on, it'll stick by itself. And when the time comes where you don't need it anymore, you can just peel it off, wipe the window and bish bash bosh. One really great solution to both heat and humidity, and this might not be cost effective if you have to do it for like 500 plants, but if you don't have that many, then it works pretty well, is to use heat mats in combination with pebble trays. Heat mats are basically on the whole a lot cheaper to run than a lot of other plug-in heating systems. And you can basically, I'll put some clips in, but you can lay them flat, pop a pebble tray on top, fill it with water, and then sit your plants on top of that so that obviously they are getting heat from the heat mats, but it's not direct heat. And as the water evaporates that is naturally producing humidity for them as well. One thing as well that I read online and this would kind of be like a DIY version of that, I haven't personally tried this but I thought I'd include it because I thought it sounded like a pretty cool idea, is apparently electric fridges actually produce quite a lot of heat on the top of them so this could essentially act as a heat mat and you could put your pebble trays on that and assuming you can get good light to that area then essentially create that method at home using this. I have briefly touched on this already as well, but if you're able to create some kind of contained space, such as a cabinet or something like that, that helps to contain heat and humidity so, so, so well. I got my cabinet for 20 quid off eBay and I converted it into a plant cabinet. I did make a video on how I did that. So again, I'll link it down below, but that has been, that's been the environment that has kept so many of my tropical plants really, really, really happy and it really doesn't cost a lot. I know I've also got some plants that are a lot more robust, a lot more tolerant to things like drops in temperature, drops in humidity. So again, it's just really important to do some digging, <laughs> do some digging, do some research into your plants and find out which plants can essentially take what because if creating a massive setup to keep all of your plants happy over winter is going to break the bank or is going to be too much effort, then make sure you prioritise the ones that are going to be more susceptible to issues. As I've already said, when you do have radiators running, if you're able to run a humidifier alongside this to kind of counterbalance the dry air and help pump some humidity back into your plant's environment, then that is absolutely ideal. But there are also some cheaper alternatives if you can't afford 
afford to run a humidifier all the time. I've already just spoken about pebble trays. Pebble trays are fantastic even if you don't have a heat mat, just putting your plant in a tray with pebbles and water so that as that water evaporates, it's going to provide your plants with a little bit of extra humidity leaving pots of water around as well, kind of same principle if you're cooking, if you're boiling vegetables, leaving the doors open so that the humidity can kind of spread through your home, leaving your washing out to air dry. And also particularly if you've got plants sitting above a radiator or anywhere close to a radiator, if when your radiators, 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 if when your radiators are on, I sometimes just put cups of water on top of that so that again, any heat that travels upwards is just gonna take some humidity with it. I've mentioned this one before as well. And although at this time of year, I don't think it would kind of do the trick alone, but it does help is just grouping lots of your plants together because as they naturally transpire they release water and they essentially act as a humidifier for each other but as I say if you're running central heating fan heaters having open fires anything like that then I would not just rely on that at this time of year as kind of your only way of increasing humidity I would incorporate some of the other things that I've just spoken about as well also as I'm sure a lot of us know and it is oh my goodness it's incredibly frustrating but it is just something that happens your plants will still be susceptible to pests particularly ones like spider mites that really love drier air so as I said at the beginning of this video so important to make sure you're regularly wiping and checking your plants leaves not just for lighting purposes but also to make sure that if there is anything you need to potentially treat on your plant or isolate your plant because there are issues you are aware of and able to deal with quickly so that it doesn't get into all of your plants again I know I said that things like yellow Yellowing leaves and dropping leaves are on the whole perfectly normal at this time of year. Quite often if your plant is trying to conserve some energy it will let go of a few leaves here and there but it's important that you do remove these leaves and kind of give the plant an overall check over just because again like I said earlier with the pack instinct often pests they'll see a yellow leaf and they will be drawn to that plant because they see that plant as not being healthy. It's the same principle as why we tend to use yellow sticky traps to attract pests. If they see a yellow leaf they are going to be drawn to that plant so yeah that's just a really important thing to say. The common signs of pests tend to be on the, they tend to often start on the back of the leaves not always but they tend to be webbing, sandy residue, stickiness, discoloration, misshapenness of leaves, all that sort of stuff that all signs to look out for and as I say if you do suspect that anything is going badly wrong then get that plant away from your other plants ASAP. But yeah I think that is pretty much the gist of anything. If anyone's got any questions please do drop them down below and I will try and make sure to cover them in a video soon. But that is everything that I am going to be doing for my plants this winter. I, I hope it was useful. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.